You can see here a uh, foliage, which is a irrigation system and it lush down in the wadi. It's quite lush, palm trees. And what I'm saying here is the only way that these motherfuckers defeat you is when you bow down, yeah. suck up, kiss up yeah. to these people. Yeah. Don't do it. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on over 30 cable stations from Vermont to New York City on the internet at thestruggle.org. Our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. Octavia Taylor gave a talk about her trip to Palestine to the Israel-Palestine Peace Group of Northeastern Connecticut. And today we'll feature the first part where she gives flavor for the trip, the geography, and a bit about the people. And then some fire, Pam Africa speaking in Newark about the murderous attacks on MOVE by Philadelphia police several decades ago. Octavia Taylor has a degree in international development. She's lived at times in Syria and the United Arab Emirates. She was in the West Bank of Palestine for several months last fall, and she worked for the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. Welcome to Palestine. This is Hassan offering me some December daffodils in, um, in a wadi in Safa, which is west of Ramallah. I will show you um, my talk is divided into two. The first part, I will show you landscape, people and places to kind of situate you a little bit. And the second part really gets into the occupation and what it's like to live under the occupation. So we've always um, gravitated to the Middle East because of the generosity of the people, kindness, openness, the warmth. Um, and felt that it was really uh, a place where we could make a difference. Not so much us make a difference, but coming back to tell the story. Today, as you know, in the media, we don't really get the full story, as, as we've been talking about over dinner. And so this is part of what I'm trying to do here, to show you images that really are missing from today's media. Um, Joyce mentioned the fact that I was part in, of the Clark University certificate program. I, I tried to bring together Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs together, and we had this program. But these were, I would say, in the days of naivete, <laughs> or right around the Oslo Accords. And we've, since then, having a program like that is rather out of the question, unfortunately. Um, it's, it's a time of, of really despair in some ways. I should say also, as part of the retirement project, Steve s taught computer, um, com a computer course, Android programming at Birzeit University. He only had one course, so it gave him some latitude to, to do some research and some um, playing around and travel or traveling around with me as well. We were only given visas to go only in Judea and Samaria. That is, we were not allowed to travel. The Israeli government chose not to have us travel throughout Israel. For some reason, they saw us as a risk. So I was able to go into Jerusalem three times a week, but we really restricted our travel pretty much to Jerusalem and then travel to Haifa or Tel Aviv as much as as we would have liked to. Nonetheless, I met quite a number of Israelis in my uh, trips to Jerusalem, Israeli Jews, who were working to end the occupation. And I think this is a really important thing for, for you to know. And you probably know it already, but I was so heartened to meet and talk to so many people who are working to end the occupation who want to make lives better for their own children, as well as Palestinians. This is Hassan's family. Hassan means handsome. 
-hmm. and he certainly lives up to that name. And as I said, this, um, this family led a group of natural history buffs through a wadi, and through this uh, particular, and it was quite a group of us, as you can see, and this is one of the ways you, you meet people just by happenstance. I happened to talk to a neighbor who was part of this group, and she said, come along, and we did. So there you go. And we found another, it was another aspect of Palestinian life, people who were so interested in picking herbs and using herbs for either medicinal purposes, culinary purposes. It was just another facet, something I can imagine doing here. You know, I belong to a garden club where we talk about herbs and we go for walks, etc. Um, this gives you an idea, a little bit of the landscape. Palestine is an arid place, but it's a high land. So much of the land is about 2,000 feet, the elevation. So it's um, dry, but cool, relatively cool. In the summer, it's hot, but in the winter, it gets quite cool. This is a picture's Cremesson Winery, which is a winery near Bethlehem and Beit Jala. Um, there was, interestingly enough, a couple of months ago, a, an Israeli court uh, decided that no, there was to be no wall built, which would have been built cutting off the Cremesen winery in half, causing people who lived on one side to have to go through and get another checkpoint to get to school or to work. So the winery is staying more or less intact for the moment. And you can see there are grapes here in the foreground. There are uh, terraced olive trees, um, which is pretty much what the land grows a lot of. Grapes, olive trees. It's, and the olive tree is just such a symbol of steadfastness and will be a thousand of year, thousands of years old trees. This is in Jericho, 750 feet below sea level. Um, barren, and yet at every corner there's a hermitage, a monastery. This has got to be the highest concentration of monasteries, hermitages, places of worship, or places of contemplation. It's a bleak place and yet an amazingly beautiful place. Here's an, uh, a couple of hermitages unoccupied at the moment. And this is on the, on the way to St. George Monastery. You can see here a fallage, which is a irrigation system, and it's lush down in the wadi. It's quite lush, palm trees. To the right off the screen is the monastery. Here again, also outside Jericho, the landscape is, is just stunning. Terraced olive trees. Um, outside Bethlehem, on the way to Batir, which has now been designated a UNESCO site. And an olive tree close up and personal. This one is probably oh, 600, 700 years old. There are some um, that are reputedly over 2,000 years old. This is um, us and students from Beersaid University picking olives in Marda, which is a small town located just to the south of the Ariel settlement, or as I like to call them, colonies, um, where colonists had been coming down from Ariel to harass local Palestinians and keep them from picking their olives. And so every year, busloads of Birzeit students are fan out to different villages to help pick the olives so that, um, on, so that the colonists will, will see that there's a critical mass of people and will not dare um, go and disturb it. If there are just a couple of people picking olives, then it's free game. Let's go and disturb. So, but a group, a whole busload, that's a little bit of a different story couple of the students. I don't know if you can see these olives. If you were to pick an olive from the tree and eat it, you would cringe. It is tastes so 
horrible. <laughs> How can anybody have figured out that this olive is something that can be eaten? Well, they did. I mean, obviously, first they figured out that the oil is something worthwhile. And then with curing, little by little, you know, changing the water, adding spices, then it becomes edible. But it takes quite a while to do that, not off the tree. Hmm. So the olives are picked, bagged up, brought to a refinery, oil refinery, where they are uh, sorted, then they're cleaned and pressed, and presto, olive oil, like you have in the bottles there. This is a mountain of spices. The red spices are called zumac, and then we have a mix of salt, and the green spices, there are two different green spices there, thyme, or za'atar, and sage. And notice it's topped by the dome of the rock. So this is in a, in a spice shop in the old city in Jerusalem. We had several bakeries near our house, and it was such a treat in the morning to just go and get the hot bread. And if we missed the opportunity to get bread in the morning, well, there was always a young man coming around by bike and selling the bread. This is Hussein and Fatima, who are making a delicious dessert called kanafe. It looks like shredded wheat you know, very thin, thin uh, bits of wheat. Um, then it's topped with a cheese, a local cheese. In Hussein's case, he had his own cow, and he used the fresh cheese, and then a, a really over-the-top sticky sweet syrup. But then the results, with the cheese and the, and the kind of shredded wheat, it's delicious. This is Ahmed and his mother. Ahmed was somebody who was like our family in Palestine. He helped us find an apartment. He just was such a, a, an amazing person. He had been in the Palestinian Air Force. Did you know there was Palestinian Air Force? And he had been deployed to such places as Serbia, Yemen, um, Morocco. Uh, and that's how he spent his years, because in Palestine, there, he was not, he could not fly out of, there was no airport to fly out of. Um, Iyad is sitting with his son, Lelo. Iyad was the head of the computer science department at Beers 8, um, who was one of the first people, the first person to respond to Stephen's request about um, doing some volunteering at Beers 8. And we got to know his family, his parents. He's sitting here with his parents, who live in a town, Beit Jamal? Umar. Umar, Beit sorry, Beit Umar, right outside of Hebron, where weekly um, there are the Israeli army makes incursions, and weekly there's a young man killed. I mean, this just. If some of you follow the, the site Mondo Weiss, you can see some of the um, Beit Umar is one of the main areas where there are regular incursions and killings. This is in Bethlehem, walking along on the street. We came upon a, a group of children who were playing a game, and Steve kind of joined in and suddenly was the leader of Simon Says. <laughs> And at every turn, we had surprises. You know, we would walk along on the street, and people would invite us in for tea, or you join in in a game. It, it was just so magical. This is in Ramallah. Um, and I, I took this shot because there is a big struggle going on with Bedouins currently. And we hear of the struggle with Bedouins primarily with the Israelis displacing Bedouins from places, not only in the Negev, but in, in the West Bank. And in this particular case, these Bedouins are living right in Ramallah, and there seem to be no danger of displacement. They are living around the corner from the parliament. So behind me is sort of the, the parliament. Um, and other <coughs> official buildings for the Palestinian Authority. So I found it interesting. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe 
They will be displayed shortly, but they didn't look like they were leaving anytime soon. Their, their goats were grazing, whatever they could. Stars and bucks. Stars and bucks, not to be confused with Starbucks. <laughs> um, this, this cafe was in Almanara Square, which is a major square in Ramallah for demonstrations, celebrations, gathering, and of course the Stars and Bucks Cafe was the, um, a major gathering place. The interesting thing about um, Ramallah is that it began as a very small city or a small town. It was a Christian town to begin with. But with time, as there was, of course, more displacement of Palestinians, more and more came into Ramallah. So there's now a majority Muslim city, quite a substantial city, about 60,000 people, because the government is based there. Um, but there is also quite a, a Christian presence, and the two seem to coexist in a, in a pretty comfortable way. This is a cafe, a juice bar in Jerusalem, uh, with the guys just talking and engaging in conversation and happy to talk to any tourist and rope in any tourist to drink a little juice. The ubiquitous falafel stands, I think we had about four, pretty much within spitting distance of our apartment. This is in Tul Karim, which is a bit in the north on the Green Line, which I'll talk about later. Um, this man was selling Mohamra. Now, we, Stephen and I spent some time um, in Syria, 2009 to 2010, where Steve was a Fulbright um, researcher. And we got to know Mohamra, which is a kind of a spicy, uh, lovely dip made with walnuts and hot peppers. And, but it's unique to Aleppo. And so whenever I saw Mohamra, I thought, my goodness, this, this guy's got to be Syrian. And indeed, he, had found, he was originally from Aleppo, and he makes Mohamra. And apparently, there are quite a few Palestinians who were originally from Aleppo who live now in Palestine. And we talked about the disaster that Syria has become. And it was a really... Uh, Sad moment. Friday market in Ramallah is vibrant, full of color, full of smells, full of sounds. It's just, you know, one of these over the top kind of events, you know, jostling. This one happens, it looks like there are not that many people, but there are always a lot of people. Perhaps one of the most moving things that I had happen in the market was that because I was just buying for two of us, I wasn't buying that much. And people would just ply us with, you know, if I was just buying a handful of tomatoes, here, take them, don't pay. Now, you know, I'm an American, they could see that I could afford to pay for the tomatoes. They could have taken advantage, but no, never. It was pretty stunning. Take these, take the eggplant, take this. I can't imagine this happening here. <laughs> now, Fresco Market, here we have a car top. Um, scarves and whatnots. <laughs> color, oh my goodness, the vibrant colors. Tatris, I brought an example of that. Um, this is the embroidery that's, um, that's very typical. You can pass it around for one, two, yeah. Um, it's called Tatris. And each village has its own patterns, its own distinctive uh, motifs. So it's really people who know Tatris, know where it comes from, which village. Of course, I never got to that point. These are women from Bethlehem who are sporting the typically Bethlehem Tatris. Uh, this was at Christmas time and um, obviously very decoratively festooned. Um, this is in Ramallah. And one of the things that struck me was that people would dress up to go shopping to just do their regular daily chores. And it's hard to see in this picture, but she's also wearing carefully hand-embroidered dress to do her 
shopping, buying toilet paper, buying whatever. And it was a shock to me, you know, coming back to the States, you know, oh, I have to get dressed up to go grocery shopping. And my husband said, mm, uh, we're back now. <laughs> There's no, you don't have to really get dressed up. <laughs> This is a luthier uh, with the Alcamanji Music Association that um, puts on concerts, that teaches students both in refugee camps and throughout the West Bank. And recently, I believe they had a concert. Sandy Tolan has um, published a new book, Children of the Stone, and their Alcamanjati is featured in there. So I haven't read the book yet, but certainly something to pick up. Anyway, he's affiliated with Alcamanjati, and they train people to fix instruments, pianos, violins. Um, it, it's quite a music, and the arts are very important. This is a jack of all trades. You have something that needs fixing. He will do it for you. Uh, iconic image. Dome of the Rock, St. Anne's, Western Wall, and here we have the um, sort of the gangplank up to uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is not in this frame, it's over to the right. Now Pam Africa of MOVE. In 1978, the Philadelphia police first attacked them. In 1985, the police dropped a bomb on their home and burned down a whole Philadelphia neighborhood. My Philadelphia people are here, and one among them, there are many among them that are fighters, but one really stands out, and that's Sister Pam Africa. Pam Africa, come on up here. And, and, and call for justice for the Move 9, and justice for Mumia. Pam Africa, give a big hand. Give a big hand. She be in Jersey all the time, y'all just don't see it. On the move! Long love revolution! The only solution is to tear this motherfucker down. There is no justice within this system. Rotten DAs, rotten judges, the rotten the whole thing gotta go. I want to talk about, I want to lay some names on you. In 1978, we took a stand against this government. And my sisters, you can't see me. Uh, <laughs> as a result of that, the Rizzo administration and the United States government came to our house on August 8th, 1978 because we said no more, no more. You gonna beat us, maim us, kill us, throw us in jail without a whole worldwide response. So what we did, we took a defensive stand against these monsters, okay? <laughs> we took a defensive stand. So they came out to our home, 1,000 strong with tanks, bulldozers, hand grenades. They wound up killing one of their own cops and several other cops lay dead in the streets. But what was proven, they killed each other. We had something on our side that these will never have on their side. And that's righteousness. Yes, we had guns, but every cop that was shot was shot with a cop's gun. Divine, divine restitution happened there that day. But on that day, survival is a crime. My sister, Debbie, Janet, Janine, Merle, every last of the men, Phil, Dalbert, Mike, Eddie, and some others was arrested. We became known as the Move Nine. I'm saying the example here, it didn't stop us then. We fought these motherfuckers on the street. You got to fight them suckers when they lock you up. Don't go to jail feeling sorry for yourself. Go in there, teach, agitate, bring other people into the movement. Make them fight inside the prison. Make them fight on the outside. Make them understand this government.
sin is rotten to the core and you ain't got nothing to do but to fight this government. There is no compromise in telling the truth up against this government. May 13th, 1985, because when they thought Rizzo said that when he came to his our house that he can invade Cuba now and take it down. But he didn't understand the power of a black man by the name of John Africa because we kept coming at him and kept coming at him. May 13th, 1985, they came out to our home with a C4 military explosive, exposed the federal government, the United States government. Every last one of them came out with everything they had, dropped a bomb. And what I'm saying here is the only way that these motherfuckers defeat you is when you bow down, yeah. suck up, kiss up yeah. to these people. Yeah. Don't do it. Because yeah. I'm saying John Africa taught us the power of truth is final. Long live revolution. My brothers and sisters, as we took this journey, as I took this journey, and other members of my family, I look out and I see warriors from the inside, warriors from the outside. We unite together. I'm Larry and everyone else out here that we fight with, the New York Coalition, the Campaign to Free Mumia, and all these, all the other organizations. I'm saying we stand steadfast against this government. Let, and, and in the words of my brother Abdul, and know people say, Pharaoh, let my people go. People, let Pharaoh ass go in this motherfucker fall on the moon. I knew she could hold your attention. Yeah. On the move. 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 On Friday, August 21st, a memorial rally by supporters of the Syrian revolution to remember the 1,400 killed by chemicals in a few hours in Syria two years ago. It will take place in Times Square, New York City, at the intersection of 44th Street and 7th Avenue. It starts at 5.30 p.m. and will go on till 8. It's part of a group of demonstrations worldwide. Now a portion of an interview I did with Yasemin Mather, an exiled Iranian living in the United Kingdom. She advances the views of the radical Iranian opposition. Um, it's not a win-win situation as some people in the Islamic Republic are trying to portray. Uh, for the Iranian people, it's been a disastrous uh, 12 years. Uh, not just um, the U.S. sanctions, but the United Nations sanctions, the banking financial sanctions, the uh, European Union sanctions. The fact that Iranian oil tankers, for example, couldn't be insured and therefore the country couldn't even sell um, oil to a large extent during various periods in the last 12 years. A bankrupt uh, country internally. Having said that, the continuation of the situation would have been worse. Uh, well, the, the, the so-called Islamic Revolution claimed it was going to be a friend of the poor and disinherited, but you say Iran is now one of the area's most unequal societies and riddled with corruption. Yes, I, I think this is one of the, um, if you like, if you look back at what has happened, especially in the last 10, 15 years, but obviously that uh, has a longer history, is that we are seeing an unbelievable gap between the rich and the poor. And this has been picked up uh, both by the Iranian press, but also by the section of uh, European and the US uh, press. Uh, the internet makes that uh, um, divide much more obvious because people in the world can go and look at 
what the rich kids of Tehran are showing on their Facebook pages. They can see the lives of the people who live in South Tehran, the poverty, the devastation, the fact that um, sections of the uh, population are deprived of very basic housing, for example, in Iran. And then we have people who um, flaunt the fact that they ride in personal helicopters or um, buy the latest, the most fashionable uh, sports car. And this is, despite sanctions, this is, I assume, flown or shipped to Iran for their personal use. We hope you watch the credits at the end of the show and the Latouf cartoon that we place each week within them. This week, the cartoon is about the police guard around the Ecuadorian embassy in London. This guard is to make sure WikiLeaks publisher Julian Assan does not leave. Its cost to the British taxpayers so far is an astounding 11 million pounds. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this is The Struggle.